welcome to 2022. Welcome back to our Monday Mindshares. This is our first uh, video of 2022, and it's a good one. Um, it's coming from, I'm going to get straight into it, a, a fascinating paper that came out over the Christmas New Year period, a meta-analysis on 45 years of research of looking at carbohydrate intake during prolonged exercise. And um, We've been kind of digesting this article and uh, this research, and it's fascinating to see some of the things that have come up in this uh, article because it it really cements in a number of the uh, drivers from which we founded S Fuels and some of the arguments that we've been articulating uh, at S Fuels for some time on optimal uh, nutrition uh, for training and racing of uh, endurance sport, a prolonged exercise. There's three areas in this paper which um, we found fascinating and it just reconfirms what we've been talking about. The first is about the effect of carbohydrate on gut distress. The second is about the benefit of carbohydrate when it's most beneficial, in particular in the spirit of the duration of exercise. And then the last is about the timing, when you should take the carbohydrate for maximal effect. So let's jump into it. You can see here on the right here of me, uh, the article, um, and you can, I'll put, we'll put the links down. If you want to go and read the full, full article, you, you're, you're most welcome to do so. It's, it's quite a document. Um, okay, so let's jump into this. The first area is that of gut and GI distress, something that, look, I think actually, a big part of why we first ever thought about creating this product was uh, SVILs was because of this issue. We were dealing with ourselves. We checked in with other athletes. We found that many athletes had this similar issue. Um, and uh, when we started looking into it, we found there was a number of studies that were happening by sports science studies that were happening during, you know, prime uh, endurance events, uh, Western States, Ironman races, um, uh, UTMB, and they were looking at this gut and GI distress issue. Well, this study uh, meta-analysis across the 45 years was certainly calling out that as the concentration increases, certainly that risk of gut and GI distress increases, particularly above 8%. And when you look at the type of dosage that a high carbohydrate trained athlete uh, needs to take in because their fat oxidation is so low that the amount they need to take in, it's very easy to get into those very high concentrations and those high concentrations over the period of time of the race can lead to the gut and GI distress that we've seen. And this article goes on to talk about this research paper talks about the, um, the, the reality of performance being impacted by that. And in a lot of cases, actually uh, athletes uh, unable to finish the race. And I think back in 2016, you see the bottom of this on the right here. Uh, one of the articles that we wrote back in 2016 was that ultra induced endurance racing uh, DNS or did not finish. What's the number one reason? And this article that we wrote back then went and talked about gut and GI distress. The research showing is the number one reason for people not finishing. Now, um, this uh, paper talks about what is happening, which is the, you know, the blood flow to the gut beginning to be restricted as high intensity exercise happens. You begin to have hyperhydration in the gut and this feeds on itself. And before you know it, you begin to have you know, mechanical and psychological, uh, physiological issues in the gut causing uh, the distress that I'm sure many of us have experienced in, in endurance sport. Um, but um, what was also interesting in this, uh, this uh, research across these 45 years, it called out fructose seeming to be, uh, because it's being slowly absorbed in the gut and it sits in the gut and it, it has this osmotic effect and attracts water into the gut, last thing you wanna happen, have happen, of course, in uh, endurance prolonged exercise, uh, you want things to move very fast through the gut. So again, um, I think it was about 2017, we wrote this ultra gut impact uh, articles, probably one of the most uh, viewed uh, blog uh, articles that we, we wrote ha has been read so many times. And it talks about all of these things of the, uh, hydration, high intensity exercise, the heat that's happening in the gut, um, uh, fructose, and all of these things causing this kind of perfect storm 
and uh, why, uh, from an S-Fields perspective, um, we thought that if you could, you know, improve the efficiency of fat oxidation, you just don't need to take anywhere near as much uh, of carbohydrate into the body so that your concentrations of carbohydrate per hour can be dramatically lower than that of a high, high carbohydrate dependent uh, athlete. So that was the first um, area that we, we found very kind of comforting to see that um, the research is showing consistently across this 45 year period being an issue. The second area was really looking at their study into across this period of time, where did carbohydrate have, you know, obvious benefits and where did it have less relevance? And um, it looked at this with respect to the duration of time of the particular exercise. Um, now, no surprise, as you have short, you know, duration exercise where it is you, typically in a competitive environment, the intensity is much higher. Uh, the relevance, the benefit of carbohydrate in all the studies is more obvious. So think, you know, to one hour or short, uh, several hours, et cetera. Uh, this could be uh, 10K uh, running. It could be uh, Olympic distance triathlon. Um, you know, it clearly has, has, has a role there in that very high intensity. intensity. A lot of what happens in the race is in, you know, uh, anaerobic uh, states, et cetera. But what this article went on to uh, call out, which we highlight in the yellow here, as the duration, I'll just read it here, as the duration of the exercise is prolonged, greater than four hours. So greater than four hours. So this is for, a, firstly, a lot of marathon runners, certainly most 70.3 uh, Ironman racing, all of the Ironman racing, uh, 50K, 50 miler, uh, 100K, 100 miler fits in this category. So what it says is, as the duration of exercise prolonged beyond four hours and the intensity inevitably decreases, the performance should depend less on the availability of carbohydrate since the percentage of energy contribution of carbohydrate will be tempered in comparison to fats. Thus, it is not surprising that most athletes consume less carbohydrate, 20 to 40 grams per hour, than um, what would happen in endurance racing last, uh, for, for endurance racing happening four to 24 hours. And that's what we've been talking about at SFIELDS for some time is that as you begin to improve the fat oxidation capability of the athlete, the amount that you need to take in is far less. And therefore you're reducing the risk, you're reducing the need to carry it, to use it, to consume it. Uh, and obviously the gut GI distress risks associated with that. And it's that 40 to 50 gram ceiling where we've been referencing for some time, mainly because at that point is really where the risks begin to more dramatically increase for gut GI distress. And what you use below that, whether it's 20, 30, 40, um, is a function of, well, how efficient is your fat oxidation uh, efficiency that you've set up and, um, and trained for? And, um, you know, what is the intensity that um, your particular race uh, involves? So uh, we did a interesting, um, I think it's a one hour uh, metabolic flexibility uh, webinar, Dr. Dan Plews and I on this topic. And we show lab data that he, he had run with uh, his labs and his students looking at um, the relevance between the efficiency of fat oxidation and the performance in endurance sport. Uh, we then have some case studies. We talk about one particular Matt Kerr going from 0.5 uh, grams per minute of uh, fat oxidation and now able to oxidize 1.8 grams per minute. And hence, uh, last year, um, in each of his uh, Ironman and half Ironman races, uh, broke three records, course records, age group records, and uh, won uh, his, uh, he was the number one amateur in every race that he competed in uh, Ironman, half Ironman last year. So um, we, we know that this performance uh, can be improved as we begin to heighten our fat oxidation as this 45 years of research shows that if, if it is racing in that beyond four hours, the dependency on fat oxidation is that much more important. Um, there are still things to do. 
and use carbohydrate. And I just want to be clear that uh, for S fuels, as much as we promote low carb living, low carb aerobic training, as we look at high intensity training and racing, we absolutely see the role of carbohydrate uh, supplementation in that. Um, but it is, you know, the foundation for endurance sport is firstly to have a highly efficient fat oxidation metabolism, and then ensuring on top of that, that your carbohydrate oxidation capability uh, is, uh, is uh, optimized. So the third topic was that around carbohydrate timing. And this was, I would say, music to my ears as we read through this and digested this because it's been a paradigm that we've been talking about at Asfield since we began also. Um, and that is with respect to when is the right time to begin taking carbohydrate for its maximal effect. And this, you know, this meta-analysis across this, you know, period of time, over four and a half decades, they were calling out that the results most more consistently show that the advantage of taking carbohydrate is when it's taken in an interval period during the uh, exercise or competition, racing, what have you, um, as opposed to taking that uh, or consuming that prior to the beginning or the start of that racing. And they, the, 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 the research actually talks to, well, you could actually take it before. However, you would need to account for two things. One is, you know, the risk of gut GI distress, uh, which is, it's, it's a factor and it's, it's interesting. But then what's really interesting, what they went on to say was that the other aspect they called out here, or it could provoke insulin disturbance and therefore, and their interpretation of what that insulin disturbance would do is, and therefore possibly create a rebound hypoglycemia, which means a lowered blood sugar. And, and it could do that and it would do that, but our interpretation is a little different to that. And the interpretation, I wouldn't say different, I would just say it's expanded. And the expanded is that by provoking that insulin, not only could it have that rebound hypoglycemia, that reduced blood sugars before you start the race, but what it will definitely do, and, we've, and Dan has proven this in the labs, it will absolutely dilute the fat oxidation capability while that insulin is uh, in the system. And typically that's you know four, five, six hours that can be in the system. Um, and so, you know, our advice and what we've talked about, we wrote um, an article starting back in, I think, 2018 on, you know, the first hours, you know, prior to the race and the first hour of the race, what should you be doing in terms of taking different uh, foods and drinks, et cetera. The last thing you want to be doing is switching on your insulin, spiking your insulin, shutting down your fat oxidation. Um, because the implications of that is you're now dependent only on carbohydrate as you go into that race. We did a, another Monday Mindshare on this, and we talked explicitly about that, you know, hours before the race and the first hour of the race, what you should be doing. We've done some videos with Dave Scott on this topic. And then I wrote a white paper with Dave uh, Scott on this topic of, you know, metabolic flexibility and what you should do before and going into the race in terms of limiting that carbohydrate before the race and really waiting for that first 30 to 45 minutes before you begin to start uh, taking carbohydrate. And what you're trying to do there is open up the channels in the muscle tissue that allow uh, glucose to come into the muscle cell without the need for insulin. And in that state, you can be both allowing fat, uh, fatty acids and glucose coming into the muscle cells for oxidation for simultaneous oxidation of fat and carbohydrate. And again, this uh, 45 years meta-analysis alludes to this uh, benefit and the risk of if you take carbohydrate before the race, you have this insulin provoking effect. And uh, that's certainly what we've been promoting at S Fuels as risky for racing. So uh, fascinating uh, paper. I think it concludes and it confirms a lot of things we've been talking about at SFIELDS. I hope you find that interesting. I'm going to put all the links for uh, the SFIELDS articles and the white papers and the prior videos, Monday Mind Shares, we've done on this topic. I hope you find it interesting to get uh, your oxidation optimized and your race results uh, certainly optimized and maximal uh, here in 2022. So thanks again for joining us. Talk to you.